just a spacecraft that is going to go and smack an asteroid. It is fantastic to see it in real life. DART will only be changing the period of the orbit of Dimorphos by a, a tiny amount, and really that's all that's needed in the event that an asteroid is discovered well ahead of time before it might impact Earth. You can't have a mission like DART without finding the asteroids first. That involves searching for near-Earth asteroids, getting them in the catalog, calculating their orbits, tracking them, keeping an eye on them. You know, as a kid, I loved astronomy, I loved Star Trek, and so I became a research astronomer. My first observing run ever was observing the impact of Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 with Jupiter. I never would have known that somehow my career would kind of come full circle to be part of something that affects people's everyday lives. I feel really honored and humbled to be working in the field of planetary defense because it can affect people. It's just really exciting to have that kind of role in an area of science that has such a broader impact, you know, figuratively and literally. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Josh Handel, and I'm a public affairs officer here at NASA, and I am so excited to be joined today by Dr. Kelly Fast, who you just had the opportunity to meet. Kelly, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you, Josh. I'm glad for this opportunity to answer some questions. Kelly's here to answer all of your burning questions about planetary defense at NASA and the DART mission. If you have a question you'd like to ask, send it in using the hashtag AskNASA or by writing in the comment box wherever you're watching today's broadcast. So Kelly, in your video, we learned a little bit more about your role with NASA's Planetary Defense Coordination Office and the DART mission. And you have this really great line that says, we need to find asteroids before they find us. So if we need to, we can get them before they get us. Can you tell me a little bit more about why that's important and specifically for a mission like DART? Well, sure. I think it was Don Yeomans who coined that phrase, uh, find them before they find us. And then so I kind of added to it with get them before they get us. But uh, even though uh, DART is a very important test here to try to get some tools in the toolbox, should an asteroid ever be discovered that does pose an impact threat, we still have to do that other side of the coin, which is really the primary mission of finding near-Earth asteroids. And so the program at NASA, the Near-Earth Object Observations Program, uh, funds projects to uh, take telescopes uh, every night, surveying the skies, looking for new near-Earth asteroids and uh, uh, calculating their orbits. Uh, telescopes like the PanSTARRS telescopes at University of Hawaii or the Catalina Sky Survey at University of Arizona. Um, other telescopes, uh, uh, both funded by NASA and then also uh, observatories around the world continuing to follow up those discoveries uh, in order to fill out the catalog so that we even know if we would ever need uh, a technique like DART uh, to divert an asteroid. And you'd want to know that well ahead of time. And so that is why you'd want to find them well before they find us. It's a great answer. Thank you, Kelly. All right, well, all of your questions are starting to fly in, so let's get started. As a reminder, if you have a question you'd like to ask Kelly about planetary defense at NASA or the DART mission, send it in using hashtag AskNASA or by writing in the comment box wherever you're watching today's broadcast. So Kelly, Zach Burnett on Twitter asks, what kinds of light curve modeling are done on a mission like this? Because from what I understand, resolving power of optical telescopes usually isn't enough to resolve asteroids. So how do you infer the geometry without directly observing it? Well, that's a good point because uh, the uh, asteroid system, Didymos, is going to pass uh, Earth well, well away from Earth, but it's a chance to look at it with telescopes when DART impacts. And that is going to be how we determine what happened after DART impacted the moon of, uh, of Didymos. But uh, it's still so far away, like it was mentioned there in the question, the resolving power is small. And so you just see this point of light, but this point of light gets brighter and fainter and brighter and fainter as that moon of Didymos, Dimorphos, goes around uh, Didymos and passes in front, passes behind. You see the two together, you see one blocking the other. And so that's why the light goes up and down. And so the period with which that light goes up and down, which represents the time of that orbit of the moon around Didymos, uh, that is what will be changed by DART. DART will impact 
uh, dimorphose and just change its speed slightly. And so that will change that period. And so in telescopes on the ground, yes, they can't resolve the individual asteroids, but they can look at that combined light and through modeling, the astronomers on the investigation team will do a fantastic job of, of backing out that information to be able to assess what effect uh, did that DART impact have on the orbit and then essentially on our capability to be able to deflect an asteroid uh, of that uh, size regime should we ever be faced with with that need. That's a good point, Kelly. And you do mention that we are going to a binary asteroid system and actually targeting the asteroid moon. So I would imagine that's important for this experiment. Right. This is kind of a nice opportunity that that nature has given us to be able to uh, uh, test like a technique in like a laboratory setting uh, by having a binary asteroid like this. It's much easier to detect from the Earth what an impact like DART might have on the orbit of like the moonlet around the asteroid Didymos, rather than trying to test this, just changing the asteroid's orbit around the sun. In fact, an impact like DART will have very uh, uh, little uh, or no impact uh, in that sense, no change. But it's that orbit around Didymos by the moonlet Dimorphos that will be affected. And that is much easier to measure in this binary asteroid system. So everything kind of comes together where, where Didymos just kind of kindly comes to the right position where telescopes can just watch from Earth and see what that change is after DART has its encounter. And that, that information will uh, feed into uh, understanding the kinetic impactor technique in general and the DART team uh, and the astronomers on the team will, will communicate and feed all that into their modeling so that they can uh, uh, turn that into um, some real results about uh, what, what we could expect uh, should we ever need to design a spacecraft to do this for real. The nice thing about the Didymos system is you know, it poses no threat to Earth. We couldn't even make it a threat to Earth. It's a wonderful laboratory that nature's kind of put right at the right place, the right time, where we can use this combination of ground-based telescopes and the spacecraft uh, to, to do this experiment, uh, which is great because it's nice to do this at a time when we don't need it, just so if there is a time that we need it, it's not the first time we've ever uh, uh, tried to uh, uh, kind of test some of the techniques that might be in the toolbox. That's a very good point. And I think you actually may have answered Jeremy Deutsch's question on YouTube, who asks, what if the impact test makes it accidentally go more towards Earth? So Kelly, is it at all possible that DART can somehow redirect the asteroid moon dimorphos toward Earth? No, but all it will do is uh, just change the speed of the uh, the orbit of, of dimorphos slightly, change the period of the orbit. It's still going to be in orbit around the asteroid Didymos, the system will still be in the same orbit around the sun and and we couldn't change it in a way that would make it threatening even if we wanted to. And so the, and again, this is why this is a perfect uh, kind of laboratory setting, a, a perfect uh, way to be able to do this test uh, because th there is no threat there. So Mandy Lane on Twitter asks, have you ever had the idea that you should slow down the asteroid to the point where it stops moving instead of altering its trajectory? Well, that's interesting because, uh, um, you know, again, trying to change the speed of something in space, you know, that takes a lot of energy and, and you don't have to. Um, it wouldn't be possible to just stop something altogether or have it go the other direction around the sun. Everything's moving very, very fast in space around the sun. But uh, about it doesn't really matter because all that matters is that relative motion between um, a, an, an asteroid that could pose a threat to Earth and the Earth itself. And so all you would need to do is deflect it just enough so that it doesn't hit Earth. You wouldn't have to worry about like stopping its motion altogether or changing it a large amount. You only need to do it um, the, the amount that you need to so it doesn't doesn't hit the Earth. And then uh, uh, and so and that's important because the more you know, the more energy that's involved in, in changing an orbit, that's a larger launch vehicle, larger spacecraft. And it, and it might not even be possible to, to do a large change, but all we need is whatever change might be needed in the event of an asteroid threat, just need to deflect it enough so that in the future, it doesn't find itself in the same place as the Earth. 
And I would imagine, as you said, that's why it's important to find them early, right? Because the further away it, it is from us, the smaller of an impact would be needed. Right, and that's why NASA funds uh, survey telescopes to be um, operating every night uh, to uh, survey the skies, looking for moving objects against the stars and determining that, yep, these are new uh, discoveries or, okay, we're, here's one, we're seeing it again from a few years ago, building up the catalog and calculating the orbits so that we know where they are in the future, you know, of all the asteroids out in the asteroid belt, but it's the ones that come into Earth's neighborhood that we want to keep an eye on. And the, the nice thing is many near-Earth asteroids never even come into Earth's uh, vicinity, um, but there's a, there's a class of uh, near-Earth asteroids that come into the inner solar system that, that actually come close to Earth's orbit. And so we want to keep an eye on those uh, and then also um, but continue to discover the ones that we don't know about. That's the bigger concern because there is no known asteroid uh, impact threat to Earth you know, that could cause uh, you know, damage that we would want to worry about sending a spacecraft out, which is fabulous, but we want to make sure that we continue to survey for asteroids, you know, utilizing uh, the telescopes on the ground, uh, utilizing uh, uh, a uh, telescope for uh, space use that is being developed called the uh, Near-Earth Object Surveyor, uh, trying to bring all the capabilities to bear to continue uh, filling out that catalog just so we know, do we even need something like a, a mission like DART or some other deflection technique? And again, you want to do that if, if, if there is something that poses a future impact threat, you'd want to know years or decades in advance because then you don't have to deflect it very much. And you can use some of these uh, kind of more um, fundamental techniques of just like an impact. Um, and uh, that would be enough if you had years in the future that uh, uh, you had that time uh, ahead of time to work it. Absolutely. So Matthew on Twitter asks, what experiments were done on Earth to simulate DART's impact on dimorphous? Well, there are um, researchers who work in laboratory settings who uh, who take impact, who do actual impacts with with boulders. They they do studies on meteorite materials. Uh, they uh, they take things that uh, simulate uh, asteroids and do impacts in the lab. And so that that tells you so much. But to actually do this with a real asteroid, it's important to really understand what are the properties uh, and, and what are the extra factors there. I mean, we know physics with perfect objects, but to uh, have an object impact an asteroid and then to have that material blow off the asteroid for something that has like rubble on the surface, which might give it an extra kick, you know, just like if you're standing on a skateboard and you threw a baseball, it would send you in the other direction. I want to understand those properties of just not just the impact, but what happens afterwards and um, how that all adds up so that uh, that can be understood. And, and a lot of that happens in the lab and in uh, the modeling community doing calculations. Uh, and this will be a good test of all of that. That's actually a good segue into our next question. That comes from Khaled Zubi on YouTube who asks, Will the orbital debris after the collision endanger any of the satellites sooner or later? Oh, this is so far away that uh, no, this this does not pose a danger to uh, satellites on Earth or to or to uh, uh, anywhere because uh, this is so far away. Um, so that's not going to be a problem at all. Um, if anything, there's more. Uh, we have. Uh, meteor showers every year when the Earth comes around the sun and goes through uh, debris from a comet's tail, and we have the occasional meteoroid that enters Earth's atmosphere, you see a nice fireball. That's happening all the time anyway, and so this is not going to add, add to any of that. Simon Taylor on YouTube asks, what is the percentage chance of us meeting the possibility of having a life-threatening asteroid strike in the near future? Well, the, the nice thing is this is a, a very rare event um, and hopefully we'll never even have to deal with this in our lifetime and our children's lifetimes, grandchildren's lifetimes. Um, but we still would want to search and know even if uh, something like a, 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 an asteroid uh, impact that could cause like regional damage on the Earth, you know, it might be like a once a millennium type event. Uh, or even something like the uh, Chelyabinsk impact over 
uh, over Russia in 2013, where a small asteroid uh, disrupted in the atmosphere and there was a shock wave and it still did damage on the ground. Uh, and so that was kind of the most serious thing we've seen. And that's maybe like a, maybe a once a century event. And so it's so rare. You know, we, hopefully we'll never even deal with this in our lifetimes. But again, we still would want to look just so that we know. Um, and so continue surveying the skies and cataloging those objects you know, just so that there there is no surprise, and so that um, uh, you know we we might know statistics and be able to infer from uh, the uh, geologic record, but we still uh, still need to look just to know. Absolutely, we need to know what's out there before we can potentially mitigate anything. So, Michael Kilgore on Facebook asks. If DART is successful, would it help enable NASA to deflect larger asteroids? If so, what is the largest asteroid that could be redirected? Hmm, I'm, I'm not sure of that answer offhand, but certainly um, uh, in the size regime, uh, uh, Dimorphos, the uh, satellite of Didymos that is going to be impacted, uh, is about 160 meters in size. And that is kind of represents the uh, sort of the size range uh, that and larger uh, with which like, Congress has tasked NASA with, you know, finding these asteroids because these could pose a regional uh, damage threat to uh, the Earth should one impact. And so the nice thing is that uh, for that size, uh, a technique like DART, you know, could be very effective, which is why this is being tested. Uh, if there were uh, uh, asteroids that were much larger, uh, something that posed an impact threat that was much larger, or if there was uh, far less notice so that it wasn't possible to divert it with the kinetic impactor technique. Uh, there are other techniques that can be uh, utilized uh, in the case of, uh, you know, if there was a lot of uh, warning, there's some other techniques like a gravity tractor, just using, using gravity in nature, having a spacecraft sitting next to an asteroid and kind of uh, letting, letting, the aster letting the spacecraft tug on the asteroid with the natural force of gravity or enhancing it by picking up a boulder or what have you. Uh, that's just another, um, another technique that could be used with long notice. Uh, there's also, uh, you see it in the movies, but never quite the right way. Um, for instance, nuclear deflection is used, but that really, you know, the goal wouldn't be to to blow something up. Again, it's all about deflection and, and just uh, just uh, nudging it off its path. And if there's something that is very large, it would be possible to use a device to do a deflection. So, so there are other techniques that can be used, but the kinetic impactor technique, you know, can be used with uh, the asteroids that are toward that smaller range that actually there are far more of them. And so that the odds are that if something ever did pose an impact threat, it would probably be in that size range. And so that's why it's nice to te test this technique, but then continue modeling with the other techniques so that if they are required for larger size, you know, that that's something that has been studied. So uh, again, there, there's no there's no one solution, but you try to do studies in all areas just so that you're prepared and you have a nice toolbox to work with. And for those just tuning in, remember to send your questions in using the hashtag AskNASA or by writing in the comment box of wherever you're watching today. So Kelly, Robert Nolan on Facebook asks, before this process goes down, do you believe it will move the asteroid significantly? No, in fact, we, we really couldn't. As, as you saw in some of those animations, you know, the DART spacecraft is far smaller than, than this little moon, uh, Dimorphos, and, and certainly a whole lot smaller than, than Didymos. Um, and the goal isn't to move it significantly, it is just to test a deflection technique and to change the period of the orbit with that impact. Uh, and uh, because again, that's all that would be needed in the event of an actual impact uh, threat, just to be able to divert it a small amount. And so, so as you can see here, you know, the, the size difference is pretty large. And so the change in the speed of the orbit is also going to be small of the orbit of Dimorphos around Didymos. But again, that's all is needed. We don't need to, uh, to do a large deflection and especially for this to um, uh, be able to get uh, the data on what comes out of uh, the first ever you know, planetary defense test. Uh, this is just gonna be really valuable and then useful for modeling other cases, you know, where maybe something larger is needed. 
but it isn't going to be a large deflection here, but certainly a significant one that can be measured from Earth. That's that's the plan here, and uh, and folks are gearing up for that to be ready to watch that. So speaking of watching things, Eldora on YouTube asks, does the spacecraft have a camera to record the impact? Well, it, it has a camera actually to guide uh, the trajectory. So it's a very simple spacecraft, you know, with what it needs to be a spacecraft, like solar panels to generate electricity and uh, the other instruments needed for it to actually navigate to where it needs to go. But that camera is to make sure that it can line up on Dimorphos and impact it, which is done autonomously. There's some fantastic uh, uh, computer work that's done to make sure that uh, uh, it can line up on its, itself because this sort of thing can't be commanded from Earth because of the light delay time. So it's going to line up itself based on that camera. And so that is going to be uh, all for tracking to the asteroid. Um, the Italian Space Agency has contributed a, uh, a small set called uh, Lucia Cube that is going to actually take an image of the impact, uh, but it is going to continue past uh, the Didymos system after that happens, so it will capture that, but then uh, uh, after that it will be the telescopes on the Earth that will have to look for a longer period of time to determine what sort of uh, change was made uh, in the uh, period of the orbit of Dimorphos about Didymos. So Orbital Plouch on YouTube asks, how will the Leachy Cube improve your analysis of the impact of the DART spacecraft? Well, certainly just getting that look at the impact, uh, you know, that would be really valuable and, and whatever might be captured during that short period of time that uh, Leachy Cube will be uh, continuing by the Didymos system. And so, uh, you know, just, any view will be really valuable uh, for, for uh, seeing if, if there is uh, uh, much in the way of impact ejecta from the impact and uh, any uh, you know, material coming off of Dimorphos. So that will still be very valuable for uh, understanding uh, what actually happened and turning that into modeling that can be uh, uh, used to understand in general how uh, kinetic impactors uh, and the interaction with asteroid material, how that works. Harmony X on YouTube asks, how will you know if your impact actually alters its trajectory significantly? Well, and that's where the astronomers on the ground are so important here uh, with uh, having uh, large telescopes looking at the Didymos system and looking at that light coming from the system, which will be going kind of up and down, up and down in this light curve as those two asteroids uh, revolve around each other. And uh, the folks using uh, the modeling here can, can kind of back out from that, how the period of the orbit changed. Uh, and then others who, uh, from the DART team who uh, uh, do the modeling of what might happen you know, once DART impacts Dimorphos use all of that information as well as any properties you know, that are known about uh, the asteroid from, from the cameras, as was mentioned, uh, from other ground-based observations and, and uh, putting all of that together to have a better understanding of, uh, of, of what happened. And, and yes, the, um, all the modeling states, this will be something that's measurable from the Earth. And so this is kind of a, a cool uh, partnering between a spacecraft team and ground-based astronomers. And uh, it's really exciting to see how this will all play out. So Moshi Malik on Facebook asks, what are the chances that altering its course today will not make it hazardous to Earth in the next 100 years or so? Well, and that's what's so nice about this particular asteroid system. It, it, it's not a hazard to Earth, and it's not going to be in the future, and we couldn't even make it a hazard should we want to, and so, uh, which we don't want to, but we can't. And so that's why it's, it's a really good uh, laboratory for this test, uh, to have this uh, binary asteroid system uh, come within a distance to Earth where it can be safely observed from the Earth um, and do this test at the same time. So it's really actually a unique opportunity that nature has given us uh, in, in a nice setting where, where there is no uh, hazard to Earth. So it's perfect. 
It's good to hear that Dimor Dimorphus starts target is not a threat to Earth. So Ender Resting on YouTube asks, could you tell us more about Dart's solar panel arrangement? Does the offset arrangement help it navigate better? Hmm, it's interesting. I'm not exactly sure how to answer that question, but these are uh, these uh, uh, fascinating solar array, arrays, these rollout solar arrays that have been used on the International Space Station. And so this is a, uh, a neat opportunity to take a, a, a tested technology and use it now on a spacecraft uh, and uh, uh, and uh, I don't think that their placement uh, is important, except that they just need to not be in the way of the instrumentation on DART. But this is a, a neat chance to utilize this technology that's already been used on the International Space Station. So Kelly, we have time for just one more question, and I'd like to end with your career, because your career is, at NASA sounds so interesting. And for, for anyone listening today, what was your path like in your current career and what advice uh, would you have for someone wanting to pursue something in planetary defense? Well, I was a research astronomer at Goddard Space Flight Center before I came to NASA headquarters and became more of a bureaucrat. But the nice thing is now I'm in this position where I can uh, support some really fantastic people and uh, and uh, help to manage a program that uh, keeps all of these efforts going, finding asteroids, following up, characterizing them, calculating orbits. And so it's a real privilege to get to do that and work with some really fantastic people and support them. And so science is a route. I was in Astronomer. There are people, engineers who are involved on the DART mission and scientists. But I must say, you know, to work in planetary defense and at NASA, I always say if it's just scientists and engineers, we'll be in big trouble. We need all kinds of people, budget people, public affairs people. Uh, we need uh, uh, lawyers and policy people. And I mean, so there's there's so many ways uh, uh, to support any field. And so it is possible to pursue your passion and also be involved in something like planetary defense or other activities at NASA. Well, Kelly, thank you so much again for joining us today and for everything that you do at NASA. It's been a pleasure. Well, thank you, Josh, and for all you do, too. And thank you all for watching at home. You can keep up with the DART mission on social media by using the hashtag DART mission. And you can also follow NASA's solar system on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can keep up with NASA's Planetary Defense Coordination Office and asteroid-related efforts on Twitter by following Asteroid Watch. And for the latest news on DART, visit www.nasa.gov slash DART. Make sure to watch the DART launch, currently scheduled for November 24th at 1.20 a.m. Eastern Time. Thank you so much again, and keep looking up.